Hello everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Audio Support, the series where we answer the audio-related questions that you guys wanted answers to. And if you've not seen the first episode in this series, where we talked about how do you figure out your preferences when you're just getting started, what is the difference between PCM and DSD, and what exactly is timbre and what contributes to it, then head over to the link in the description to watch the first episode. Also, if you've got any questions you'd like to see answered by myself, DMS, or Resolve in a future episode of this series, then head over to the headphones.com forum and submit your question in the Audio Support submissions thread. So let's get into some questions. Is Tidal's new Max update actually lossless? Well, uh, let's find out. No, no it isn't, at least not always. Get subscribed so you don't miss the video that's coming on that. Does the output voltage from my DAC into my amp matter and why from Bernie? Um, yes, it does. The output voltage from your DAC is your signal level. If you have two DACs, one with an output voltage of two volts and one with an output voltage of four volts, the one with four volts is gonna be six dB louder even at the same position on the volume knob of the amp. Ideally speaking, you actually wanna have as high an output voltage from your DAC into your amp as possible because then any picked up noise along the interconnects, for example, is gonna be proportionally smaller compared to the actual signal. So you'll get better dynamic range and your amp also doesn't need to be applying as much gain, therefore amplifying noise itself less. So that's good. But the main thing is you don't wanna be clipping your amp. Normal XLR line voltage is four volts and for RCA it's two volts. Probably doesn't matter if your DAC output's a little bit higher than that. A lot of DACs nowadays go for five or six volts, for example. That's probably okay. But if your DAC is outputting 10 volts or higher, you probably want to check with your amplifier manufacturer to make sure that that's okay and you won't be causing any problems. What are convolution filters and how are they different from parametric EQ from DP? Equalization or EQ is a way of changing the frequency content of your signal. And the most basic way of doing this is a graphic equalizer. You might've seen analog versions of this like the shit Locius for example, but it's basically preset bands which you can adjust the gain of to change the level of adjustment, but you can't precisely adjust the frequency, just whatever the presets are, and you can't adjust how much of an area around that frequency is affected or the quality or Q factor. A parametric EQ though, which is done digitally, allows you to adjust all three of these things. You can adjust the exact frequency you want to change, you can adjust the gain or the level of adjustment, and you can adjust the quality or Q factor, which changes how much of an area around that frequency is affected. Parametric EQ is great because it's a very simple operation that does not take much computing power. It can be adjusted really easily. You can often do it on the fly as well. And so where convolution comes in is where you need to make some much more complex adjustments. A convolution file is an impulse response file, which if you do an FFT on this impulse response, describes a frequency response. And the advantage here is that you could be kind of arbitrarily complex and do all the changes you need in one operation. Say you wanted to do some room correction, for example, and make your speakers completely flat. Well, you can record some noise and see what the frequency response of your speakers are, and then you can try and make 50 different EQ changes to try and get it as flat as possible. Or you can just find out what the impulse response that describes that frequency response is, invert it, and then use that as a convolution file, and boom, your output is now gonna be flat. The player will convolve or combine the impulse response with whatever is being played to change it as described by that impulse response file. And this allows you to make really complex changes in one operation. There are some additional advantages, like the fact that convolution files don't need to be minimum phase. You can describe an impulse response that has a different phase response than what the frequency response it's describing should have. So you can correct phase and frequency response independently. Whereas with EQ, when you make an adjustment, it also adjusts the phase and usually you can't get around that. The disadvantage of convolution files though is that you can't adjust them on the fly, they're a little bit trickier to make, and not as much stuff supports them. Why does some gear have an invert phase button from Robin SYL? Well, if your product has one, the invert phase button changes what's called the absolute polarity of the signal. Now, audio waveforms are an AC or alternating current waveform where they alternate between positive and negative voltages. And having the correct or zero degree absolute polarity means if you feed a signal into something, when the voltage goes positive, then at the output, that voltage is also going to be positive. Having an inverted or 180 degree out of phase signal means if the voltage going in was positive, at the output it will be negative, and vice versa. You can see these two signals here are exactly the same. They are both a 1 kilohertz sine wave, and when one goes positive, the other goes positive. They have the same absolute polarity. But these two, whilst they're the same signal in terms of its content, it's still just a pure 1 kilohertz sine wave, one of them has inverted polarity, meaning when the other goes positive, this one goes negative. 
So for a lot of musical content, this can potentially have an effect, because a lot of music will have quite asymmetric waveforms, which will be affected quite drastically by the inverting of the polarity. No content has changed, but take the strike against a drum for example. If that initial leading edge should have been positive, the speaker driver should have been moving towards you and pressurising things, but instead because the polarity is flipped, it's moving away from you and depressurising things, that can potentially be audible. So certain gear will have an invert phase or invert polarity button, which basically means positive is now negative and negative is now positive. The signal content has not changed, it's just flipped the absolute polarity, and that's so that if you have music that is in inverted polarity, or you have something else in your chain that inverts the polarity, you can correct it. Certain speakers and headphones do that. The uh, Hyferman Vara, that's a good example. That's wired in inverted polarity, and some people prefer to correct it. I would seriously recommend not worrying about this too much though, because quite frankly, absolute polarity whilst it's audible is only really audible in certain instances. It's not generally considered to be something particularly evident. And more to the point, you don't know what your music is. Your music could be inverted polarity, it could not. There could be certain pieces of that music which was inverted polarity, and you'll be changing it back and forth constantly. There is no absolute correct setting. If you know you have gear that has inverted polarity, it might be worth changing it, but don't worry about trying to correct songs with this. Does using optical splitters reduce the digital signal quality going to the DAC, and what is the best way to duplicate an audio signal to output to multiple devices without degrading the signal quality from the hipster crow? The quick answer to that is that splitters work, but they can sometimes have adverse effects on signal quality. The first reason being that some splitters will actually just straight up change the data that is going through them, and so it is no longer a bit perfect, your music is being altered in some way, and that's not ideal. But most of them don't do that. Passive splitters definitely won't change any data because they don't have any way of doing so. They just take the incoming connection and literally wire it directly to two or more outputs. That is all. But whilst it's a digital connection, SPDIF does have an analog component to it, which is the clock signal. That is the timing information telling the DAC when it needs to convert the next sample. These two graphs show measurements at the analog output of the same DAC playing exactly the same digital information. The only difference is that the level of jitter or timing inaccuracy on the incoming SPDIF signal is different. That's all. And as you can see, it can have a negative effect. And some level of that can be caused by poor quality optics if it's an optical splitter, that extra set of connections and splitting the signal itself can cause extra jitter. And with an electrical or coax SPDIF signal, that has a characteristic impedance of 75 ohms, or at least it's supposed to. And if you are splitting the electrical connection between two sources, you can't maintain that. So whilst they do work and the data itself will probably arrive intact, you're not actually within SPDIF spec and you might see some negative impacts on performance as a result. That can also cause some problems if you're doing much longer runs, so that's worth bearing in mind. But active splitters don't have this problem, because they aren't actually splitting anything, they are regenerating it from scratch. They take the incoming SPDIF signal, they put the data into a temporary storage, a buffer, and retransmit it using their own internal circuitry and clocking. But whilst there's no longer any issue with signal strength or impedance matching, because everything is being regenerated fresh from the splitting device, you now have another problem, which is clocking. Let's say you had a nice high quality streamer with very low jitter outputs, but you now put one of these splitters in the way. This splitter is regenerating the signal and its clock signal is coming from its own internal clock, not the source device. And so if it's got a poor quality clock, even though you've got the world's best streamer ahead of it, it's gonna have a pretty poor quality output. And as we saw, that can negatively impact the performance of your DAC. So they work, they generally don't alter the data itself, but they can have a negative impact on clocking. So I would avoid using splitters if you can. It's much better to use a dedicated digital to digital converter with multiple low jitter outputs from the get go. But if you do need to use them, they do work. Another option is that certain player software will allow you to output to multiple devices simultaneously. Rune, for example, you can just group DACs together and output to all of them. Even if some of them are on the network and some of them are directly connected to the computer, you can just output the same info to all DACs at once. How do I get tube goodness on a solid state speaker amp for headphones from Artkin? So what makes tubes sound like tubes is kind of a combination of two things. The first is that they have quite high levels of distortion compared to most solid state gear and quite often will have a second order dominated distortion profile. Now this you could replicate either by buying solid state gear that just naturally has a much higher second order distortion level, so check measurements and see if you can find something that matches, or actually software like Distort, which there's a link to in the description, can modify your music files and add that kind of distortion in deliberately 
deliberately to give it a more tube-like sound. The other reason though is output impedance. Tube-based devices typically have a quite a bit higher output impedance than solid-state devices, and for any dynamic driver system, be it dynamic driver headphones or speakers in general, this will change the frequency response of those devices. Some solid-state amplifiers actually have a high output impedance option as a feature, so the Hollow Audio Bliss and the Syncsa SA1 are good examples of that, but you can also do this yourself by making or buying an impedance adapter. This is effectively just a non-inductive resistor wired in series with the headphones. You can make an XLR to XLR adapter that you can just connect in between your headphones and the amp to achieve this, or commission one from a cable maker. If your amp had a near zero ohm output impedance before and you put a 10 ohm resistor in series with it, then the effective output impedance becomes 10 ohms and that will change the frequency response of your headphones in the same way as if the amplifier itself just had a 10 ohm impedance to begin with. Just be a little bit careful when doing this, you need to make sure that the resistors have sufficient heat dissipation for at least a few watts so that you don't cook them, but that's the easiest way to achieve it. I hope you found that video interesting and useful, and if you've got any further questions you'd like myself, DMS, or Resolve to answer in a future episode of this series, head over to the headphones.com forum and leave your question in the submissions thread. I'm Golden Sound, this is the Headphone Show by Headphones.com, and I'll see you next time.